All right, so I wanted to follow up um, on the podcast from the podcast I did right after ICCX, and I want to talk about like the agnostic consultant thing, right? So here's what precipitated this this video, and this is a really important point here. There are a couple of things that I say as it relates to integrators and consultants that we've experienced in our career that I think it's important for people to understand um, where my opinions come from on these subjects, okay? So I say two things. I say, number one, if you want to be an industry 4.0 integrator, you can't enter into vendor agreements where you are setting sales goals with vendors or OEMs that you have to meet in order to maintain that partnership, okay? So uh, that's the first thing I say, okay? If you want to be an industry 4.0 integrator, okay? And I'm going to explain why I mean that. And then number two, if you're the end user, there are specific questions you should be asking your integrators when you're doing digital transformation, which is industry 4.0, so that you're vetting your partners and you assemble your team your scrum team, your digital transformation team correctly, okay? Uh, and those one of those questions is you ask your vendors, do you enter into these agreements? Um, now, I, I've said that you, don't, you can work with integrators who enter into these agreements, okay? But you should also hire, you should make sure that you're not having them be your architect. You should hire uh, an integrator or a consultant who's fully agnostic to be your architect that they're gonna answer to, okay? So let's go to the first one, which is, if you want to be an industry 4.0 integrator, you can't enter into these agreements, okay? So what are these agreements? There are many different types of examples, but in general, they go something like this. Uh, You're a systems integrator, you may have a panel shop, you may have an automation group, you may have a business intelligence group, okay? Most integrators who get big, like large integrators, and when I say large, I mean, $10 $10 million a year or more, like they're doing $10 million in revenue or more. Those large integrators generally try to be uh, everything to everyone, okay? So they generally are doing two types of work. Uh, work number one for the, the, the general, the, the typical systems integrator is trying to get big may work in many different types of verticals. So I may do some water, wastewater, I may do some energy, I may do some discrete manufacturing, I may do some food and beverage. I work in across an entire group of, or a, a, a tire, entire group of verticals, okay? Um, I am going to organize my business like this. I'm gonna have uh, applications engineers who used to be senior engineers who are basically just selling. Okay, they're basically just doing business development, but they're supporting business development staff and they're quoting projects and that kind of stuff. Then you have senior engineers underneath those application engineers who actually lead the projects. And then you've got tons of juniors and contracts underneath those seniors who you are getting your next senior from. And, and there's super high turnover. They're the ones who actually do the work. The senior is sort of the one who's signing off on the work. There's a massive turnover in those groups of juniors and contractors. Um, And when I say massive turnover, I mean greater than 50% every every six months. Only a fraction, maybe one out of 10, one out of 20 of those juniors will will become a senior engineer, and then even a tinier fraction from that will become an applications engineer. You generally become an applications engineer when you're tired of doing, like you're tired of traveling, you know, you've, you've been, You've been doing systems integration for 10, 12, 15 years. Your employer wants to keep you because of what you know. And so they put you into a a job where you're not going to travel nearly as much. The problem with that is that the applications engineer gets, after a year, year and a half, gets too far away from the technology. They're not doing the work anymore. So the, the recommendations they're making in the projects don't line up with, you know, current day technology or current day best practices or best in class. The problem with the senior model is that the senior becomes more of like a project manager rather than a senior developer, which is reason they're in that position to begin with. They stay close to the technology, but they spend way more time managing people 
managing milestones, managing expectations, as opposed to leading actual integration. So that drives those integrators to try to do things as repeatable as possible. So they'll try to make a product that they pass off as custom to each customer, or they, you know, they try to do things as repeatable as they possibly can. They try to sell projects that are just like projects they've done before, but maybe that project that they did before is no longer the best way to approach solving a problem today because technology has evolved, okay? Moore's law. So that's one of, that's how they're structured. So what they'll do is they'll enter into vendor agreements with vendors or OEMs who own hard, who uh, own and sell hardware or software for the projects that they've been doing because they're trying to read they're trying to do that project over and over and over again, right? That's basically what they're trying to do. They're trying to sell a solution at full price to every every customer, right? And this is one of the things that drove me nuts. Was like an integrator would basically have their customer pay them a million dollars to build a solution they're going to sell over and over and over again but then not pass the savings on to the next customer. They'll try to sell it again for a million dollars to the next customer or at 800,000 or whatever. And you know, they try to do that for 10 years, they buy a big ass boat, they you know, build a big vacation home in the mountains. Meanwhile, they're literally ripping off their customers because the customer isn't hiring you to be a laborer. The customer is hiring you to be an expert, like a brain surgeon, okay? Um, and you expect when you hire a, a contractor to come to your house, someone who's going to do your roof, you expect that contractor to tell you what they would do as if, if it were their home, not what they would do if they were trying to sell you something for your home, right? That's what you think you're hiring in a systems integrator. All right, so the integrator will enter into these agreements with these vendors and these OEMs because what they want to fatten their bottom line is they want to get discount. If they know, hey, I'm going to sell that project fucking 20 times over and over and over again, it'd be a lot nice. It'd be really nice if, A, I got some protections from the vendor. So every time someone says they want a project something like that, they'll call us. Number two, uh, you know, the vendor or the OEM will call us. Moreover, it'd be nice if they gave us a discount on the software or the hardware we're using for that project. You know, some type of volume type discount. Okay, so you enter into that agreement. Well, now that here's the dilemma. It creates a conflict of interest. Okay, and this is a, a major problem. It, the problem became bigger once companies moved from just automating processes like, you know, flock tanks and, and react, you know, uh, life sciences, bioreactors, for moving from just automating processes to, all right, now what we want to do is automate our business, the industry 4.0 stuff. So then those integrators now are at a strategic disadvantage as it relates to doing what's best for their customer because they've entered into these partnerships. So that's integrator one. Now, the customer doesn't know the difference between integrator one and integrator two. They find out later after they've already spent a lot of money. So integrator two is the agnostic integrator. It's the integrator who is the consultant, who's the one who says, Here's, here is a patchwork of all the best in class solutions available in the market right now for various layers of the stack. Here's how they, what they have in common, okay? They support these technologies, they have this development philosophy, they have these types of support agreements, whatever it is. Here's what they don't have in common. And if we're going to put together an infrastructure, a full stack infrastructure, the best way to put that infrastructure together is on this common technology that all these solutions support. And you should pick this hardware from this vendor. You should pick this software from that vendor. You should pick this software from that vendor. You should pick this connector from that vendor. That, that's the second type of integrator. That's the industry 4.0 integrator. The former integrator was the industry 3.0 integrator. Okay, who enters into those partnerships, right? Who's trying to sell the same project over and over and over again, right? I, we've, I've been doing digital transformation for a very long time. And while there are some commonalities between each digital transformation initiative, and that is the stuff that we talk about, the basic concepts of digital transformation, the common pillars, et cetera, et cetera, every journey is different because it's about taking a very unique business, digitizing it, 
and making it more efficient on the unique grounds that that business is built on. And no two companies are alike. So how is the second integrator built? Well, first off, the second integrator doesn't use applications engineers, okay? They just have senior engineers who are lead developers, scrum masters, and architects. Number two, they're full, flex, full stack fluency. Those senior integrators, those senior engineers have full stack fluency. They understand business intelligence, they understand connectors, they understand PLCs, they understand MES systems, they understand SCADA, they understand cloud technology. But that fluency comes from an understanding of the, under, the underlying technology that these, this software and hardware is built on, okay? And how you could piece it together. Number two, you don't have juniors and contractors working on your team, okay? What you have are engineers who are a member of your scrum team. They are, and they're, all of them are subject matter experts in some layer in the stack, okay? So you're building cross-functional teams that are built up of subject matter experts, okay? Number three, they're not selling the same project over and over and over again. Every, every digital transformation journey is unique. However, a really good Industry 4.0 integrator is using some basic principles for ascertaining what they should be doing and how they should be doing it, okay? Number four, Industry 4.0 integrators don't enter into vendor agreements that put them into a direct conflict with what's in the best interest of their customer, okay? So when I was saying that when, I, when we talk about how you should not, you should be asking these questions about your integrators, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, I'm talking about those specific details, all right? So let me fast forward. There was a, some troll who, who posted on the, the podcast 